Today we're looking at what balance means when investing. Now, the question uh, on a lot of people's minds is when it comes to an investment portfolio, what does it actually mean to be balanced? Well, you know what, after 19 years of being in this industry, I can actually say I don't know anymore. Um, and the, the reason I say that is balance for me when I first started in this industry in 2000, I think of a seesaw. I think of 50-50, defensive and growth. And that's always traditionally been how a financial advisor across you know, various dealer groups approaches, the asset allocation of a portfolio. I think what we're seeing at the moment with the highly competitive market that we work in, the more funds try and outcompete or outdo each other, um, that term balance is starting to get stretched further and further and further apart. Um, and some good examples of that are when people come in regularly and they say, oh, I might be in an industry fund. It could be you know, any one of them. Um, but what they turn around and say is, I've achieved X with a balance fund. And as I say on the show most weeks, we've got to look under the hood because for me, if you're going to compare a balance fund with 50% growth and 50% defensive assets, you can't then look at a competitor who might be running 85 to 90% growth assets and call it balanced. And we refer to that a lot when we talk about risk analysis. We talk about how fast do you want to drive the car? If the speed limit's 100 and you're doing 130, well, that may not be the right speed for you. Similarly, you could be doing 60 or 80 in a 100 zone, and that may not get you where you want to go. So the term balanced is really about saying, what's the level of risk that somebody's prepared to take on? And then having assets that are selected with that risk profile in mind, so that at the end of the day, the ultimate test is, can you sleep or not? And I think making sure that you, people that have a balanced portfolio don't want significant swings in value, but they also want to be able to achieve inflation protection or a rate of growth that's greater than inflation so that they can keep pace and, and maintain the value of their investments in real dollar terms. So I always stress to people, just make sure you actually look under the hood because balance doesn't mean what balance used to mean. So how can a balanced profile differ between funds? Well, look, I think that's a, that's a really good point because I think as we alluded to a little bit earlier, the thing that people need to keep in mind is what's the actual allocation of what's been invested? Because it could be 50-50, but as, as we noted just before, if you're gonna compare 50-50 to 80 or 85 or 90% growth assets, you're not gonna get the same outcome. So whilst it may be branded the same, it may not actually be the same under the hood. And I liken it to, to cars. You can have two Holden Commodores with two different engines and they'll go at different speeds, but they're both Commodores. But that's not the best way to look at the actual performance of what that vehicle could do. And in, in many episodes prior to this, we've always talked about super funds being a lot like cars. You don't need a Ferrari to deliver bread. And if you're a trader, you've probably got a Ute, you probably don't have a Mini. So. Finding a fund and an asset allocation that's appropriate for you is very important, but also understanding the composition of what you're investing in. Because we have a lot of people come in and go, oh, I'm in the balanced option here. And when you actually look under the hood and say, well, you're actually maintaining a very high allocation to international assets or a significant amount of property or a very high allocation to fixed interest, whatever the profile may be, they actually are quite surprised by the speed at which their car is going. Because they thought they were doing 100 in a 100 zone, but in actual fact, they're probably doing 130 to 140, which is actually maybe outside of what they thought they were trying to achieve. And the ultimate test there is to then say, well, what happens when the wheels fall off? Because everybody likes making money when the market's going up, uh, but there comes a day when uh, things start to get revalued and how you maintain your asset allocation will then determine the, the downside protection that you have when uh, when things get a little wobbly. What about Australian Super and Host Plus? Just take us through that. Yeah, so look, they're two examples of um, balanced funds that obviously have different asset allocations. Generally speaking, you find Australian Super balanced option maintains 80 to 85% growth assets. So if you've got a Commodore and I've got a Commodore and we're driving down the highway outside and you're doing 140 and I'm doing 100, if they're both the same, we should drive next to each other. But in 
actual fact, if you're doing 140 kilometers an hour and I'm doing 100, it's very hard to say that one would outperform or underperform the other because it's not a fair reflection of the actual size of the engine of the car. And I use that vehicle analogy a lot because what's held will also then impact the outcome, be it positive or negative. Um, Host Plus, one balance fund of the year last year, uh, runs up to 90% growth assets. So if we're comparing a portfolio of 50-50 to 90-10, it's quite unfair to say, well, has one done better or worse than the other? Because you're actually not comparing apples with apples. You're actually comparing apples with Mars bars. Um, so it's important to look under the hood and make sure that you actually understand the allocations that you maintain within your superannuation fund, wherever it may be, because the term balance may have a different, a different interpretation. Oh, I had a gentleman in this morning who said, look, I've got a balance fund with a retail super fund that ran 58% defensive assets. Now, if we compare that to 90% growth assets with Host Plus, they're both balanced, but they're both very, very different. And he was quite upset that his portfolio that he'd had for, for, for many, many years actually hadn't performed in line with the Australian equity market. And when we pointed out, well, you don't have the same allocation to other funds, you're not gonna get the same sort of return. You, he didn't actually understand on the, on the downside what it would do in, in the positive market. But when he said, well, I don't wanna take on any more risk, and that was quite appropriate for him. So it's always about looking at what do you need and how do you feel about risk as opposed to what your friends are doing or what you'd like to achieve because everybody's got a different view of, of what risk means to them. All right, international allocation um, is certainly an option for higher growth. And then there's uh, property listed and unlisted as well as infrastructure and Australian equities. Take us through that. Well, again, when we're looking at what we're gonna have inside a portfolio, it's about looking at the composition of the assets. So international assets have always been on the growth side of the portfolio because they're generally capital in nature. They don't provide the same rate of income as something like an Australian share because they don't benefit from things like franking credits. So the growth portion of a portfolio, when you're running 80 to 90% growth assets, you'll generally find that you have a higher allocation to those sectors. From a property standpoint, depending on the property that you hold, that's also another one where understanding the breakup of the asset allocation is very important, or the, the slices of the pizza is another way of looking at it. If you've got very high allocations to international, to property in Australian equity, and things do start to come under pressure from a valuation perspective, you know, we're seeing the Australian market trade at all-time highs at the moment, same with the US. There comes a, a date of reckoning when things start to get revalued. And it's important to be able to make sure that you have a suitable level of diversification and you're happy taking on the amount of risk that you're maintaining because what you think you could have and what you do have are very, very different because each sector provides a different sort of performance in the portfolio. Property's there for income, international's there for growth. So it's important to have a, a good mix. We're speaking with Lee Smith from Envision uh, Financial. After the break, we're gonna look at some of the challenges of asset allocation and what we should be looking at for an investment portfolio. Yeah. It's super today. Um, Luke, what factors can affect the asset allocation that we maintain in super or in a broader portfolio? Yeah, look, that's that's when we get regularly. Um, obviously, it depends with what we're trying to achieve. So I generally say to people, let's start with why and work backwards. Um, younger people generally have more of a growth orientation. Um, and as people start to mature or get closer to retirement, they start to get very concerned about how they're going to fund the lifestyle that they're after. So thinking about your asset allocation and, and what balanced means for you will then have a direct impact on your ability to fund your lifestyle costs. It'll also then have an impact on the types of assets that you maintain. And we've seen interest rates fall over the last couple of months with some rate cuts. And as a result, we've seen equity markets start to get a lot more strength because people sit at home and say, well, I can't, I can't live on 1%. Where else can I go to try and get a greater rate of income, and that's pushed people into equity markets. Um, and in some instances, forced them to buy things that 
they may not have otherwise considered or thought were appropriate for themselves. I think the old adage of, I'm starting to get older, I need to be more defensive, is actually a bit of a misnomer because people come in and generally say to me, I need two things. I need good, strong income, and I need growth to offset inflation. Um, so if we think about the asset allocation, if we drove at 50 kilometres in a 100 zone, we're not actually going to generate the income we need to live, which means that we would put more of our capital at risk. So when people come in and say those sorts of things, when I put to them, well, do you need a good, strong income stream? And they say, yes, and I generally need sort of three to 5% to meet my lifestyle goals. Well, we're not gonna achieve that with huge allocations in cash and fixed interest. Whilst it has a, a purpose in the portfolio to give us some downside protection, thinking about our income needs will then drive our asset allocation, not an assumption that I'm getting older, I don't want to risk things, because not earning enough income is a risk in itself, because we don't know what's going to happen to the value of markets, both now, in the future, and, and, and down the track. So I've always been a big advocate of controlling your income stream, or controlling it the best you can. And we've touched on the use of franking credits in other shows. Um, so understanding what you need is important because everybody's attitude to risk is, is different. And if we have a balanced approach in this scenario that doesn't have an appropriate allocation to Australian shares, international and property, you may not be able to get the capital growth you need to offset the effect of inflation. Um, it's also then taking into account what other assets are held. So if people have a large direct property exposure, you may then look to invest the super fund in assets that are outside of that sector so that you can get a broader level of diversification and achieve your balance, take into account your situations and what you have because everybody accumulates assets differently and super is just one vehicle that can be used to hold assets. People can use things like family trusts and companies and hold assets in those different structures. So it's about looking broadly at what is my asset allocation, but more importantly looking at what is my income need and how comfortable am I with the speed at which I'm going to drive? Because the ultimate test is obviously, can I sleep at night when markets are good? And can I sleep at night when markets are bad? Because everybody likes it when things are going up and not so much when things are going down. So thinking about how you can maintain your needs and your cash flow and your objectives always comes back to starting with why and then structuring it forwards from there. So what should people look out for when considering their investment portfolio? Yeah, look, I think what people can do, you know, for, for the listeners at home that are looking at their super fund and saying, well, what am I in? I think the important thing is, remember that it's not all cupcakes and rainbows. Um, everybody likes making money when things are going up and the demand for fixed interest investments generally dwindles when equity markets are running because everybody wants to, to ride that wave when things are good. Make sure that you understand where your income is coming from. And in next week's show, we're gonna talk about some of the places that are very good for generating income as part of your asset allocation, and we'll, we'll touch on that next week. But make sure that you're using ETFs, so exchange traded funds, keep your costs down, make sure you've got some good diversification in the various sectors that you're looking to try and target, and look at your options inside your fund. Regardless of the fund that you're in, you will always have an option to change or manipulate the speed at which your car drives or the exposure to risk assets that you maintain. So make sure that you have an appropriate allocation into individual sectors. Make sure that you don't have an overweighting to one individual asset. And then if you're gonna look at what you're gonna hold or how you hold things, also check to see the proportion of the fund that's held in unlisted assets because they were very topical or very popular through the GFC because they weren't repriced to market like a normal share or managed fund was. So they're again another way to get some diversification, but they don't come without some risk because obviously they're fairly illiquid in nature and you can't be sold quickly if you do need money. So if you just check and make sure you've, you've looked under the hood, you can look at your costs, you can look at your franking credits, you can look at how you maintain your exposures, look at the allocations to individual sectors, and then obviously make sure that you're in a fund that's generating an income stream that's right for you, because everybody's needs in relation to cash flow, regardless of age, are always gonna be a little bit different, so it's important to tweak it where you can and make sure you've got what you need going forwards. So what about costs? Um, reviewing your costs is important? Yeah, look, cost is another one. Depending on the, the, the nature of the fund that you're in, 
Um, it's very important, and we've, we've touched on this in the past. You've got to check and see what you're paying for. If you have some generic investment options in a, in a fund that gives you very few ways to actually invest your money, they may or may not be the best thing that's out there. Generally speaking, cheaper is not always better, and it's important to understand the opportunity cost of what you're missing out on. So using things like ETFs or listed shares are very good ways to keep your cost down because once you purchase a listed share, you don't pay any additional ongoing fees. And we've touched in previous episodes on internal cost ratios or the charge that an investment option takes from your return. So if you are in the ABC balance fund, they may charge you 1% or 2% for the privilege of investing in that option. And for that, they manage all of the underlying assets they manage the buying, the selling, and, and the total return. Now, you need to look and say, well, could I achieve a similar outcome or better at a significantly lower cost? Because if you could go out and use an ETF at a cost of, say, 0.2 of a percent, and you're in a, in a generic fund that's charging one, that's, that's 0.8 of a percent on several hundred thousand dollars that over time will add up and, and erode the total return that you can achieve. So you need to be in a fund that gives you a lot of choice because choice can then give you not only the ability to manage your return, but also then the ability to reduce your costs and make sure that your overall investment spread is appropriate and cost effective. And just finally, controlling your income stream is part of the opportunity? Oh, look, very much so. I, I think controlling income stream for me is, uh, I often say to people that how you generate your return sometimes is equally or more important than the total return. Because if you do have a combination of listed shares and you do have a combination of ETFs, not only are you keeping your costs generally very, very sharp, but you can also then target investments that will give you three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent of total return when franking credits are considered. So when you do see the market come under some pressure, if you can meet a lot of your annual living costs with dividend income, you're taking the pressure off the capital side of the portfolio and you're buying yourself some longevity protection in relation to how you manage your assets. If you'd like to know more, you can go to envisionfinancial.com.au resources and the Knowledge Centre. And what's the best number for people to call if they need more information? Yeah, look, they can get us on uh, 02 6260 4749. They can also get us on YouTube at Envision Financial Canberra. Uh, and obviously for the, the podcasters out there, the strategy stack at Luke Talks Money on iTunes. So, Luke Smith from Envision Finance. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for